Good morning, everybody. I'm going to do a quick check because I'm using a different microphone. Can the people in the back give me a thumbs up if you can hear me in a good way? All right, awesome. Um, well, I told Robert as I was coming in this morning that this is already a huge success because the people in this room are amazing. People from different aspects of my life who are all here, who are such great thinkers and willing to push the envelope. So I already know no matter what happens here, this is gonna be a great couple of days and congratulations to KVAC for that. Um, I was very excited to get to join all of you um, because this work I think is so important and we know how often we're in situations where it's, it's hard to be an educator right now, right? It's, it's hard and my state in particular is not helping things very much. Um, and so I think really figuring out what can we do to really help continue to grow these wonderful teachers and leaders that we have, wanting them to stay with us and stay in the classrooms is so important. Um, I am from the Friday Institute, which is from North Carolina State University. And this is a couple of pictures. Oh, you know what, I'm not presenting yet. Let's see. You wanna see my slides, because you wanna see the Friday Institute, and I think Jacob's gonna help me here. Um, one of the things that people always say when they walk into the Friday Institute is that they kind of feel smarter just walking in because it's kind of a really crisp building. But the other thing is, is people that work there feel like it's like Disney World. And the reason is because we get to work with people like you who push us and think and we get to dream big, but then we also get to do. And so I think that's just really, really a huge important part of that. Oh, awesome. Um, and so, as you can see, that's the Friday Institute. I've also shared the Twitter handles there um, because I think that you, I'd love if you want to join me in this conversation, but also KVEC has a hashtag. So please feel free to join us at KVEC Forward um, as we go through our day. I wanted to share with you just a little bit about myself um, because I think it's important that you know why this matters so much to me. Um, the top left picture is actually my mom with one of my kids and another one of my nieces. My mom was a kindergarten teacher and a reading specialist. So from about age five, I spent a lot of time in classrooms. And there's still a cassette tape going around out there of Good Morning to You that I recorded for her that she played every single day with her, 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 uh, her class. And I share that because I grew up with this tremendous respect for teachers, but also a deep understanding of what the work is and always just this belief of how do we support educators. I also have learned a whole lot about learning from my own three kids as well as being a teacher. Um, and I just thought you should see my three dogs because that shows how crazy I am that I also have three dogs. Um, but a few other interesting things I think is that I taught in Henrico County Public Schools when it was the first one-to-one -one laptop initiative. That happened to be my teaching experience. And we were trying to do things that quite frankly, we put data in and got exactly out what we put in, but it was just this effort to show standards-based something, right? Um, Dr. Mark Edwards was there and he was very progressive, but the systems weren't ready for us, right? They were, I remember just saying like, I could just draw these pictures. The system isn't telling me anything I didn't already put in. But I also learned a lot by teaching kids in a low-income school and what does it take to meet those needs. I also um, ran CETA. I was the executive director of the State Ed Tech Directors Association. And I mentioned this to you because our membership was all 50 departments of ed, and some of you in this room have been CETA members. And I learned a whole lot about advocacy. Um, I had chances to write legislation and work on the stimulus package and other things like that. But I also learned that while all of our states are different, they have a lot more in common than not. And every single state, and Michelle, I'm saying this a little bit for you, is rural somewhere, right? So every single state has people that can't just run to Raleigh or run to Louisville and access great things. So working with CETA taught me what does it look like across this whole country and what can we do together and what do we maybe have to do a little bit uniquely, right? Um, and then most recently, I've been at the Friday Institute, which has been this wonderful opportunity to go deep with all my learning and work with school teams and district teams across years and across time, and also to go deep on learning differences, something I knew in my gut I didn't know enough about when I was teaching. So that experience is something that you'll notice is a theme throughout this micro-credential presentation because it's where we started our work there, because teachers wanted more, and right now there wasn't necessarily enough of that, especially for general education teachers. 
Now, if you didn't think I was crazy because I have three dogs, I also opted to run for a school board position last year. Now, I've had a really long career, so this sounds like a lot, but right, this is over a long time. But I've been on the Chapel Hill Carborough City School Board for the last year and a half. And if you want to know a whole new perspective on life, it's being on a school board. Not just from what parents care about, but also what teachers care about and the very hard and challenging decisions that our school districts make every single day. There is no easy decision. And I have had to see that right in my face. I thought I knew things and I have learned, oh wow, you needed to ask that in a different way. So that's Mary Ann and what I bring to this discussion this morning, a lifetime of asking questions, <laughs> of learning a lot, and being willing to say, hey, maybe we don't know that yet. And so when people say, what about micro-credentials? A couple of you in this room were with me about five and a half years ago when we started this. But I was curious, but I wasn't a believer yet. But I was like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. No platforms existed, by the way, when uh, somewhere in beta, but no, no platforms existed when we started our journey. So what I would love for you to do is this is going to be a two minute pause of me. I would just like you to turn to a person at your table and share what percentage of your work time do you spend thinking about, exploring, or working on micro-credentials? And then more broadly, what percentage of your time do you spend on professional learning? So just introduce yourself and share that little tidbit. Okay. I just, school learning here. Raise your hand if you can hear me. I promise I'm going to let you talk more. Awesome. Um, hopefully you learned a little bit and one of the things that I know about this group is some of you had to say 100%. Really you had to say 200% because you think about it all in your work life plus your home life. Um, and then some of you might have said 5%. I'm here. This is my introduction. And I think that's great because those of you that are new to this, push us. Ask us the hard questions. We really do want to think about that more. So I also want to dig in just a little bit to why are we here, right? So please just turn your attention for one second to this video. This is called how do I know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what, the key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular, I'm about to show you a clip to, we were in, uh, we in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. 
and funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just gonna show you the clip, check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow, that brought us in. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace. Ah. So here's the thing, the first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. So what I would like each of you to do is on some piece of paper or in your lovely new portfolio, Jot down what is your why here? What is your why for caring about this particular part of your work? So this past weekend, um, this connects to my why, um, as part of being a school board member, I got to go to four graduations. I saw 967 students cross the stage across four different graduation ceremonies. And I live in a district where UNC Chapel Hill is, and a lot of people think of us as very, very privileged, and we are in many, many ways. But what I heard in different speeches and presentations and saw is, I know we have 25% free and reduced lunch. I know we have a very large immigrant population. Um, I know we have students that struggle with many, many different things and excel at many different things. But we heard about a first-generation American who had left a war-torn country to graduate as valedictorian. I mean, I sat there just stunned. I didn't know that story. We heard about a boy who had to bury his mom the day before he started freshman year and how the school just wrapped their arms around him. And here he was getting across the stage. Um, we saw students who were known as kind of the guys that had it easy to share their dyslexia story. Like, this was all through these powerful graduations. And there were also stories of kids who really high school just kind of worked for them, right? And it just, they got through and here they are graduating. I also went to what we call Phoenix Academy, which is an alternative type school. And there are kids who no one ever thought would graduate. And I watched them walk across that stage and hear teachers share those really special strengths that those students had. And in doing that, it reminded me that even in a district that overall does pretty well, think of what the teachers, the administrators, right? and everybody who, all those services for those students, what they have to know and be able to do. So my why is, how do we make them more ready? When I was a teacher, I was only frustrated when I did, couldn't figure it out, when I didn't know what to do for the student that couldn't read in fifth grade, or when I didn't know what to do. So my why just goes back to, we have these amazing students who come to us ready to learn. We wanna help them get and be successful in life. 
and what does that look like? But holy moly, it's hard work, right? It is such hard work to meet the needs of all of those learners, both in terms of what they do academically, but also their entire social emotional learning. So that's my why, and I think it's, you all have your own and they're all incredibly right and valid, but that's what drives me is always like, is this meaningful and will this make a difference for kids? Um, the Friday Institutes is very, very similar, quite frankly, I think to, to ours, is we wanna make sure that teachers have what they need, what they wanna learn and what they need to learn, and can they do this in a way that really does allow them to apply what they're learning, but also get feedback on that. And I think that's incredibly important. The good news is we're onto something here because teacher quality is the single most important factor that impacts student, the school-related factor that impacts student learning. And leadership is the second most significant school-related factor. We have to figure out how to make sure that the quality of our teachers and administrators is very, very high for every student. We know we have some teachers that come so ready or have grown to be so ready, but how do we make sure that they're all that ready, because this is the thing, research shows us over a long period of time, that is the most significant in what we do. We also know, this is the technology adoption curve, but I've decided you can apply this to anything in life. These teachers come to us in so many different places. We're always gonna have innovators and early adopters like many of you in this room. We also have a great late and early majority, right, who will eventually come along with us or are pretty ready as soon as someone shows them and we also have our laggards. So we're not trying to just do a cookie cutter, this works for all teachers. We know that we have teachers and administrators along that entire curve, and people are at different places at different points in their career, right? It's not even, you don't just get a teacher that always stays in one place or the other, or even in one year, they might be really strong in this and not as strong in something else and wanna work on that. So all of this context, I think, says, hey, we're on to something that matters. Um, I'd like you to just for a minute think about something you learned how to do recently. Not just like learned, like I went out and researched what are the five components of X. Something that you learned how to do recently. And I'm gonna let you share that at your table for about five minutes. Um, so think about it and then share and talk about how you learned it. I would love for just about three people to share what they learned and how they learned it to do. Right, how they learn to do something. Do we have a volunteer? Whitney said she would volunteer. There's a microphone right behind you. Great, I didn't know I was gonna get to talk. Um, so I just learned how to make a little animated GIF, the little videos that play over and over so I could make instructions for people. And I just YouTubed it and learned how to do it from YouTube. So. And then did you try it? Oh yeah, I did it. Did the first one come out perfectly? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Okay, that wasn't of course quite, I hope she said, no, I had to go back and try again and learn and get feedback. But no, it okay. was that easy. It was Wow. Good. Okay, I love it. Okay, another example of when you learn something. Oh, yes, Odelia. Oh, here comes the mic. My table really wanted me to share. It wasn't that, uh, it wasn't like recent, but I only learned how to ride a bicycle four years ago, and they thought it was a great story. I learned to ride it because I was walking 45 minutes from where I lived to my grad school uh, classes, and I was like, I really need to learn how to ride a bicycle. <laughs> um, and how did I learn? I learned from a, a, you know, a lot of falling, a lot of five-year-olds cheering me on in the park and telling me I can do it, but a lot of it was just getting over the fear that like, oh, everyone knows how to do this already, I'll never learn it, and like uh, being okay with not knowing something and just like really just listening to feedback and uh, getting up and bicycling away. And now you can ride your bike? I can. <laughs> we have a gift developer, a bike rider, awesome. Do I have one more example that someone would like to share? Oh, right back there. I'm cheating because it's not me. I'm going to talk about my son who has been into technology since 19, we got our first computer in 1992. Um, he would spend his Friday nights chatting with friends all over the world. And so anyway, he wanted to network the house when he was in ninth grade before wireless and all that. And he would just, he got online and he would talk to engineers all over the world. He would read articles from the, on the internet and he just self-taught himself and since then he's been the same way. Um, he now makes 
more money than probably any table in here <laughs> doing technology. He never, he was not successful as a college student because he couldn't understand why you had to take stuff you were never going to use again. So anyway, not a slam, but it just kind of like, it just was like getting the information in a variety of ways, trying it out, and then just mastering it through trial and error. That's great. Um, well, these three examples I love because they're also different bite sizes of things, right? Different, so like how much and the grain size. Um, I'm thinking Whitney probably learned that in the course of about an hour. Odelia may have taken a week or so with some different chunks. And your son, that might have been a day. Yeah, it was a day. She's very advanced. Um, or, right, or something like the technology over a long period of time. But what you're hearing is people sought out resources based on where they were. Right? So based on where they were, they also went ahead and had to try something. In each of these examples, they had to try to do something. Now, you might have gotten feedback immediately saying, hey, you got this, right? And that's great. You showed what you could do. But in other cases, maybe you learned, hey, this network's half the house, but not the other half. Or I can ride on a flat surface, but uphill, hey, I got to figure something else out. And so the reason I share that is, I also had a really steep learning curve with this whole school board craziness because I thought, oh, you sign up, you put your name on a ballot. Well, it turns out um, there's a lot of work that goes into a campaign and you have to fundraise and do all these things. Steepest learning curve of my adult life. But I went out and I got all this information. Everyone had advice for me. I ordered lots of things. I did lots of things. Signs are a big pain in the neck. We should outlaw them. My husband agrees with you. Um, but I also had to figure out who are the right people and what's the order. And if any of you ever want to run, I can't wait to share what I learned because I learned so much from the experience. And I'm serious. I will help anyone that wants to, to learn. Um, but it was such a true, like, how do you do something, right? And in the end, I got some negative feedback along the way. Like, people were quick to say, oh, this group doesn't know you, Marianne. This group doesn't know you. Why don't you have a sign here? Like, those kinds of things. And I definitely would do it even differently next time, right? Even though I've been successful, I still learned a lot. So this whole idea of learning to do things actually is a great parallel for what, in most cases, we don't just want teachers to learn something theoretically. If any of those examples had only done the watching, had only done the sitting and observing, and hadn't actually tried and applied what they learned, they wouldn't actually have the skill that we want them to develop. And I am preaching to the choir that so often with teachers, we forget that last part of getting them to apply it. And so we're going to go through a few things. But everything you all described actually goes really, really well with what are the components of effective professional learning. And we know that it needs to be somewhat ongoing, job embedded, it, you matter, it matters to you, it's in your context. It is even better if you have support. So some of you sought out other experts, whether online or in person, but in all cases there were others that were coming around and somehow helping you, whether cheering you on or giving you feedback, and that, that was certainly true in my example too. Um, we also know that this whole, this loop, right, you see that loop. So everything you describe fits with what we know about effective professional learning. This is also my very favorite slide. I put it in every presentation I give. It's from Joyce and Showers. And the reason I do this is because we know that a lot of professional learning, right, so you start on the left here. When people engage in professional learning, if you go sit in a two-hour workshop, I did many of them as a teacher, personal mastery is at 5%. And skills into the classroom is also at 5%. That's it. You add demonstration. So somebody showed me how to differentiate in my classroom, as an example. Well, I saw the demonstration, but look at that. Personal mastery goes up a little because I understood it a little bit more because I saw it. But I still am not changing in the classroom because of busyness, because I haven't had that chance. The one that blows my mind is practicing personal mastery shoots way up but it still doesn't translate into the classroom when you just practice, right? It's when you get to this piece of coaching and mentoring, which I want to say here, I think can be in a lot of different formats, not just a coach standing in the back of your room. That is when we see changes in the classroom. And that to me is a really big deal. So I always share this, those of you that know me have seen it a million times, but we have to keep pushing for that, and that is part of my hope for micro-credentials, is that that feedback is actually a form of coaching. And it's a form of saying, hey, you got this, but maybe have you thought about this? And then people go back and try again. 
I'm not saying it's the end all be all. I love how Robert started that this is part of a context. I'm gonna share with you how we've used this, but I do think it's getting closer than most teachers have to that coaching in a way that is more flexible. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what are micro-credentials, but also why. Um, so for us, it's a digital form of certification indicating that an educator has demonstrated competency in a specific skill. And we've already talked about learning by doing, applying, all of those things. Um, but really, at the end of the day, they have to actually demonstrate their learning. And you switch that back to the two-hour workshop where nobody ever asked me to demonstrate anything, right? And so let's really think about that big difference. We also know that a lot of times professional learning really doesn't change practice, but also teachers feel kind of frustrated because they get excited and then there's not really a process there for them to then share what happens. This is, um, I am sharing these slides with you at the end, but um, this is um, from TNTP's report, The Mirage. So they did a really in-depth study about four years ago about professional learning. And what we found is if you look at teachers across their careers, most are just kind of marching in place. A few are really improving, and a few are actually declining over time. And part of that might be because of the demands, but this is based on evaluations over time. Most are just kind of constant, right? And that's not surprising. And we also know that teachers, it's not just that we know that professional learning might not change practice, they know it as well, and that was also demonstrated by this. And lastly, teachers are feeling it. Hey, if I'm supposed to personalize and I want to personalize for my students, why am I not getting opportunities like that? And I love that teachers are pushing us on that, right? Because if we say everyone has to do the same thing, go back to our chart a few slides ago, we know that's not the case. Um, so I want to share with you a little bit about our work. Some of you are more familiar than others. Um, but we did start five years ago. We started developing when there wasn't a platform. Um, we've, I'm gonna share a little bit about that later. We've worked with a lot of different platforms. We continue to. But I think at the end of the day, um, we've always built micro-credentials because there's been a need or a specific purpose. So we don't have the whole world of micro-credentials. We have over 40 of them that have been very purposefully designed for different reasons. We did start out with these based on our learning differences work, and so we had the best situation in my mind where we had grant funding to build them and to assess the first many of them, which gave us a lot of flexibility to learn and to try things, um, which I think helped us a great deal. That's continued to be a really big part of our work. We've also had well over 4,000, I think we're getting closer to 5,000 submissions across the different platforms. Um, so we feel like, all right, we've really tested this, we've learned a lot of things, and um, we like to think that along with several of us in this room, we might be able to help others skip some of the steps that we had to go through, um, but also um, move forward even further. These are some of our topics. Um, you'll notice that there is a lot that do have to do with learning differences or learner variability. Um, but we also have done some on computational thinking and teaching fractions and teaching statistics, working with some professors at NC State. So the range is wide, but it's not as random as it seems. It's always serving a specific um, purpose. Now, we tend to build our micro-credentials in stacks. Um, so what that means for us is that we know that there are a series of learning, and if we're really chunking them out, we often think of this kind of as Bloom's taxonomy type things, where in the beginning you're building an understanding, but then at the you wanna start applying and ultimately creating. And so if you look at our stacks, we often guide teachers along the way. Um, I have to say a lot of people do the first ones, the building and understanding. I think, in, and they're always applying that in their classroom, so we're getting to applying, but really getting to that creative and sharing with other teachers. I think then that, you know, those numbers kind of go smaller and smaller but sometimes they think that's because of time, um, or it's not what they needed right then. So they're always applying, but it does shift as you go up that Bloom's taxonomy with the different stacks. We have several design elements that interestingly we worked on early and have really held strong for us, and I think um, this is where I think working across a lot of people has been really, really important because we've been pushed with our partners for rigor. Um, my fear when this all started was that this could be fluffy. <laughs> um, you know, like, oh yeah, you do it, you get it, okay, great, and then at the end, does it mean anything? Um, I was very shocked to learn early on that um, about 54% of people earn it the first time. This is data from us, from Bloomboard, from Digital Promise. It's very consistent. 
Um, so that, but what I love, and I'll share one of our examples with you, is that about half the people that don't earn it the first time come back, and almost all of them do earn it the second time once they've gotten feedback. So when you think about that, that's a really big deal. So they get their feedback, they didn't earn it, and about half of those people consistently now over four to five years do in fact come back and try again. Um, and usually they improve because they've gotten pretty specific feedback on the part that maybe they missed. Sometimes it's really deep conceptual, um, like what creativity really is in the classroom is actually much harder than people think it is. Um, sometimes it's something really simple, like look at that data source you shared with us. Um, so what I love is we see student work, we see the strategies, I mean the artifacts are just unbelievable that we see and we'll share with you um, a project we did really looking deeply at that. So our design elements are that, first of all, they're self-directed. Teachers who want to go learn something have the opportunity. I think we all in this room would love even more if that's based on their conversations with their principal, their professional growth plan, all of those things. But at the end of the day, they are self-directed in that I care about this, I'm going to do it. Um, we also want these to be job embedded. Every single one, like we actually struggle in the summer because teachers aren't working with kids, right? So sometimes we'll say, well, if it's an individual student you're supposed to work with, you can, but we know that for some teachers, they might do some of the learning, but wait and do the micro-credentials in the fall, and that's okay with us. Other teachers have figured out creative ways. We have year-round schools, right? We have all these things. But it is an interesting thing where we have to pause and say, these are so job embedded that if it's the summer, we have to kind of think a little bit differently about them, and we have done that. They're also competency-based. If you come in and you know this, you can jump right ahead and demonstrate your learning. So if your school says, we want every single teacher to make sure they really understand executive function, and you have done so much work on that, the way they're designed, you can jump right to that. But if you didn't even know what executive function was until your principal said that, you can also have access to all these different learning pathways that will get you there. And that is competency-based in a way that I know we're struggling to figure out what that looks like for kids, but I do see it living through micro-credentials already. And lastly, they're research-based. I think every, the ones that I have worked with and the partners that we have work really hard to make sure every single resource, everything we're doing, we're not gonna suggest a skill that is not research-based to improve instruction. And I think um, that's something I'm really proud of from the, like really looking at this collectively because I think we hold each other to that standard and so that research base is something that's very, very important. So I'm gonna pause just for a second, make sure everyone's doing all right. Okay, so again, we've been trying this for a long time. Um, so I'm gonna share with you five ways that we've used micro-credentials. In no way, shape, or form do I think these are the only ways to use them, but what they are is part of the system, and I think it, what I'm hoping, because you're gonna hear so many examples today and tomorrow of different states, districts, right, how people are using them. I'm trying to go a little bit more like what does this look like as part of different opportunities and then we're happy to share with you specifics about like our learning differences, courses, or those kinds of things. Um, so the first way we have used these is standalone. Um, we have our micro-credentials available on multiple platforms where teachers come and they just decide I want to learn about this and they jump in. Now when I say standalone, there are a lot of learning resources and pathways. So when I share with you my next example, you'll see what I mean. But it's not part of a course we're teaching. It's not part of a summit that someone's at. Um, this truly is a teacher finds that, they want to do it, and then they use the depths of the micro-credential and other resources to learn. So that's one way that we have many of ours are available. We never stop someone um, from doing that. We've also retrofitted micro-credentials into content. So we had built our first learning differences course which is an online MOOC that about 10,000 teachers have taken across the world. And we were already starting to work on micro-credentials and we wanted a way for people to apply them. So we looked at the content we had built, what are the critical pieces, and we built our micro-credential to align with that. Now I will tell you, you don't have to take our course in order to do the micro-credential. But we have seen some differences in things like mindset when someone didn't. So like, we are a whole strengths-based approach to learning differences. The first um, submission we got where someone didn't take our course, they used all this deficit-based language about kids. And we were like, so the course is really good at that, it seems, because 
as soon as someone. But you know what we did? We actually adjusted our micro-credential because that was so important to us that we realized that sure, that micro-credential worked great in the course, but if someone comes to it not from the course, they need more learning opportunities around strengths-based. And so that's how we, we adjusted that. But the retrofitting to content worked well. It was truly a timing issue, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that way, but it did work if there's something you've done for a long time and you're like, I think I can extend that learning, have people apply things more. It is a way that worked for us and it worked well. Now we've also started with micro-credentials. So our computational thinking course, um, which was built as someone's, part of someone's dissertation, it turns out, um, they actually started with the micro-credentials. So they said, what do we want teachers to know and be able to do? They built the micro-credentials around this. And then they built the course to support that. But once again, the course is not the only way. Like that's really important to us, that it's not the only way you can learn it. But hey, if you want to jump into our free MOOC, <laughs> and that's a good learning pathway for you, which has a lot of different personalized options, we know we're at least leading you to that micro-credential. And then the fourth one is supporting face-to-face -face or online learning. And I'm going to share with you how we actually started this work. It was a wonderful person, Abby Futrell, who was on our team, was working in a Northeast North Carolina district that um, she had been going to over time. But when she got to a point around the SAMR framework, um, which is a technology integration framework, um, they're actually, their district couldn't, did not have enough funding for her to go back and go into each individual classroom and coach the teachers, which I understand. So Abby said, well, I don't feel like they're there yet. I really, we had, they've done these great sessions. I've gotten them, but these teachers really need more help in applying. So she built the micro-credentials as a way to have teachers go and apply what they had learned with her and then submit artifacts and get feedback from them. And it really, really worked. She was able to see their deep thinking, and we always push for this reflection, right? So even if she had done observations, if she hadn't had time to go back, she might not have even gotten that reflection piece unless she had this micro-credential submitted. And so we often have been able to utilize micro-credentials as an extension to learning and as a way to push people to apply what they learn, just give them that little, like, don't stick the folder away. You actually have to go back and do something after if we are together in face-to-face -face settings. And the last way, which I love because I know several of you in this room are focused on higher ed, is we've actually integrated micro-credentials with pre-service teachers and pre-service principals. Um, there's a program with UNC and NC State where the two universities came together, usually they're competitors, but they came together and they focused on lateral entry teachers, which with all the teacher shortages right now, we're seeing more and more of. They actually base this on CCSSO's in-task standards, which are kind of broad um, but deep standards for teachers. In the past, if you wanted to be a lateral entry teacher in North Carolina, you basically had to go and take the equivalent of six courses over three years while you were a brand new teacher who had no teaching really background and you were supposed to drive after you taught and people would go to all these different universities wherever had their class. And, um, and so what I love about this pathway to practice is this was all job embedded. They did a kickoff and then as these new teachers were in their classrooms, they were learning through the micro-credentials. They didn't call them that, they called them competency mastery based learning. UNC wasn't ready for micro-credentials. Um, then what they would do is be able to submit those artifacts over 18 months. So suddenly these teachers were able to put all that driving energy that not connected into this program and they were part of a cohort doing it. So back to our what's effective professional learning. So they just got additional funding to continue this work but it's been really exciting. And we also use micro-credentials with some pre-service principals that we work with. Um, we, they, first of all, they wanted to try them and see if I'm gonna ask teachers to do this, what does this feel like? Um, but also it was some areas they needed to learn about. And so we were able to do that as well. Um, so very exciting. Um, I think for us, that was a really big deal. Um, so there are several considerations, which context, is it online, face-to-face? -face? Again, it can be standalone, but if you're doing that. Content, build your own or use existing. Hey, if someone has a great micro-credential out there, there is no need to build your own necessarily. And we have directed people to some other ones that we really like that happen to support our professional learning. And the last thing I think is teacher choice versus your choice. So are you saying, hey, everyone in this coaching cohort, we want you to do this one? Or are you saying, please choose from the six, which one makes the most sense? And so those are three really critical considerations if you look across our implementation 
that we've thought about, but none of this says you can't still have a standalone, but as we're embedding it in different professional learning opportunities or systems, these are the things we're thinking about. Um, I'm gonna do just a second to show you how we know this is effective, but I'm not gonna really go through the slides because you'll get them. Um, we did do a study in our MOOCs. Groups don't know that they're assigned to different treatments. So we had a control group that went through our MOOC, they submitted their project, had conversations, and then we had a treatment group that was asked to do the micro-credentials. We showed statistically significant differences of what they applied and what they submitted if they did the micro-credential. We believe that it pushed them to go deeper on their application. We believe the feedback worked and almost every single person that didn't earn it the first time in that situation did in fact redo it. If someone got negative feedback in the discussion or someone said, what about this? Not one person went back and redid their project. So we do think the micro-credentials really push not just for the application to be deeper, but also for that feedback and that redoing it. So that research has shown that. And then I also am gonna give you a link to a paper that we did recently um, with Digital Promise where we looked across um, our attention micro-credential submissions and went deep on you know, what kind of themes are we seeing and um, we noticed a lot of things. Teachers as, resources, as researchers using empathy, leveraging peers, student teacher metacognition. So not only are they thinking about their learning, they're helping their kids think about their learning. Um, and then also the student ownership. So through micro-credentials for teachers, they were building student agency, um, which was kind of amazing. They were sitting down and having those conversations. So I will share all that with you today. I just wanted to let you know this exists and hey, we're starting to see something that says this might really work. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, I think I've actually referenced all the challenges just because I got excited, but I do want to make sure that you remember your why as we go through today and tomorrow and obviously all this work. Because the second we forget about why we're doing it, I think we could get where it becomes kind of rote or it gets a little more specific and I think that really matters. And I love this quote, Shayla Rexrode from our team uh, pointed this out to me, but a good hockey player plays where the puck is. A great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. We really, I think as a group, to make this into something, to make it, to keep it real. I know it's real for us, but we're at this point, I think, where we gotta really be looking at where do we wanna go? Not just where do we want teachers to be, but where do we want this work to be? Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so I will take a minute, if I can, Robert, for a few questions. Yes, okay. Um, does anybody have questions? And I can also answer after. Yes. I'm Cindy Stevens. I'm from Georgia. Uh, several of us were just at another meeting where micro-credentials were discussed, the National Association for State Directors of Teacher Education Certification, NASDAQ, uh, and Friday Institute was mentioned. But one of the, the barriers, I think, to knowing where the puck, puck is going to be is the cry for, but we, they're not standardized, but we don't know what the standards are. At least the universities are standardized. It's taking away from the work of the universities and they're standardized. Um, and that is a national debate. I've been engaged in this work for about four and a half years, right, Robert, we have? But would you speak to that? I will. Um, and I think, you know, I started out with the same concern, right? I used the word fluffy, but um, I really was worried this could just become a fad. Um, so I think a really important aspect of, I'm gonna say rigor and standardized for us has been working both with Digital Promise and with Bloomboard. Um, I think we have our professional learning, the standards we set for ourselves and what are those learning objectives and research based. But in working um, collectively and with both organizations, I think what we realized is having some standards on templates, having that conversation of people that are looking across hundreds of micro-credentials has made us better. Um, we know that if we put the Friday Institute NC State on there, we need to be believe in it, but for us, part of that is knowing that we're having consistent conversations around consistent standards. And we have made that a part of basically all of our work and we've remained really committed to that process. So um, at the beginning, it's really hard. I am grateful to both organizations, but I will tell you in the beginning it's hard because you think of it in certain language, you think of it in certain ways, but what we've decided is making sure we're part of this bigger ecosystem that's holding this standard and also consistent has been more important. But you'll also note we're part of multiple ecosystems, but in my mind, we're pushing for those same high standards. So for us, that has just been critical and I um, to really help us. And so I would think for higher ed, I don't know if it's, you know, 
Digital Promise or Bloom Board or both, or is it a different set of standards you said? I'm not sure, but I think having those standards where we agree this is what it looks like and this is how we know is really important. And for us, it has been. I know I'm kind of at the end, so I think what I'm gonna do is let, if you wanna ask me questions, I'll make sure I'm available. Um, I do wanna end kind of going back to your why and um, asking you just to think for a second about your highest hopes and greatest fears around this. Um, this is a protocol we often use. Um, people get really excited and that means they have hopes, but usually there's also some fears, which you've expressed one of my ongoing fears, Cindy, so <laughs> I, uh, I think being here together is part of how we address that. Um, so as I close out, I would just like you to think briefly about your highest hopes and greatest fears as you're going through these two days and ask the hard questions, especially about your fears um, and what we can do. But I really appreciate you all taking time with me. I know we've done a lot, so I wanted to share it all with you. Um, but there's so many details that, um, you know, if you have questions. Um, I did put together a bit.ly, which is a link to the slides, which I'm now seeing is not very big, but it's bit.ly forward slash. And then it is case sensitive, um, K-V-E-C-M-A-W. And if you go to that, you have my contact information, you have everything, so. And also I can give these to Robert to share too. Um, so thank you so much and um, I can't wait to hear what you all are doing. Thank you.